Again, if you take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, starting at verse 11. I'm going to break this down in two parts. Um, so I'm going to read the first part of it, then the second part of it, uh, which is 18 through 30. But we'll read the first part of this, and starting at verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of the disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the regions round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities, and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously appareled and live uh, delicately are in king's courts, but what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. The title of the message this morning is The Question of John. The question of John. Now we look at this, and and I was thinking about what was going on this week, and everything that was transpiring, and all these problems we're having, and and you watch the news, or I'm sure you've heard of what's going on. So I won't go into details about that. But our faith sometimes wavers a little bit, and we keep meditating on the Word of God, as Brother Chuck was telling us, and what Joshua was told, and there. Others in the Bible are told that we're supposed to meditate on the Word of God. When that contemplating, we wonder, when is Christ coming back? When is he coming? Uh, at what point in time? Which we don't know, but we're, we're waiting, aren't we? We're still waiting. 
But as things continue to get worse and worse, we're just a little perplexed about the waiting part of it. And so when we read a verse of scripture like this, and we see John the Baptist, the one that was the precursor for Jesus Christ, the one who was the forerunner, the one who was to set the example for, for all for to set Christ up, is now questioning, is this really him? Is this really the Messiah? Or is there someone else going to come that's better than this one? Kind of hard to believe that John would think that. So as we look at this, try to keep that in our, our minds that we too question sometime. And I don't believe it's a sin. It's just our human nature to do that. So in view and introduction to this, we see the raising of the widow's son had eventually produced a profound impression. I mean, this man was dead. There was no doubt about it. He was dead. The rumor went throughout all the region round about, as the scripture says, and was, and was carried also to John while laying in his dismal prison. So he got word of this. Every resurrected soul is a mighty testimony to the saving power of Jesus Christ. There again, we're not to lay down. There again, we're to be about the master's business. There again, we need to do something and not just stand idly by. I think the problem with some of the uh, Christians today is this. They put on a set of blinders and hope it goes away. <laughs> it's not going away. You can think that all day long. You may not want to even want to talk about it. You may not want to discuss it. You may not care anything about it. But I'm going to tell you it's not going away. Amen. So if you're putting the blinders on and hoping that's what's going to happen, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. By reason of such, many had have believed on him. John chapter 12, verse 10 through 11. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So, look at our situation today. What does the Liberal Party want to do? They want to put us to death. They want to get rid of us. They don't want to hear our message. They're not concerned about our message because they are in unbelief. Even those who call themselves Christians, I'm seriously doubting that they are. They have a religion. They believe in God. But if we go back and look at Paul's life or Saul's early life, we can see that he was religious. He believed in God, but he didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I mean... We do pray that the president will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I've never heard him say he believes in Jesus Christ. I've never heard him say that. I've, he believes in God, but there again, unless you believe in Jesus Christ, you know, there's the importance of it. So the first question is my first point here. Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? Verse 19. It does seem strange that such a question should come from John the Baptist. From him who saw the Spirit descend like a dove upon him and who bore record. This is John who was speaking here and bore record that this is the Son of God and who said, Behold, the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29 and 36. So John made that statement. He told his disciples. Here he comes. Behold the Lamb of God. When he was baptized, we see, Behold the Lamb of God. John gives record of himself. In, chapter, in, in John chapter 1, let's turn there and, and, and just read that, of this record that John does give of himself there. John chapter 1 and verse 19 
And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou? Why baptize this? Thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor uh, Elias, neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. Now, Kind of strange words from John, now in prison, now contemplating, huh, is this Jesus? Is this the Messiah? Is this the one that's supposed to come, or do we look for another? And then i got to think about it and think, well, what's going to happen to us when we get thrown in the jail? What is going to happen to us when we get thrown in prison? What is our thoughts going to be? What is our mind going to wonder? You know, okay, God, where are you? <laughs> you know, we're doing all this for you, but where are you? What Now what? And that's what John is facing here. He's facing loneliness, darkness, a dungeon. I mean, we're talking about a mountain man that was free and loose to go out and, and eat wild honey and locusts, and, and now he's reduced to the prison walls. So we can understand his predicament. Did not Christ himself say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least is the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Who's the least of the kingdom of heaven? Jesus Christ. He's greater. But yet John is the greatest of all prophets. Now some say that John was the greatest of all men. That's not what it says. Because it's verified there in, in Luke where he says that among women he's the greatest prophet. But one greater than he is here. The one greater than he is, of course, Jesus Christ once again. So, yes, it does seem strange, but why should the Almighty Deliverer allow his forerunner to pine away in a dark and loathsome dungeon? Why would you do that? Why would we ask, if we end up there, would we ask, God, why are you letting me rot here? <laughs> What's the purpose of it? It may be as easy for us as for John to say, he must increase, I must decrease. But when the decreasing goes on and on till we almost question our relationship to Christ, that's a sad state to be in. I don't really believe John the Baptist even wanted to think that. But understand his situation. Understand where he's at. Understand what has just happened to him. All his freedom has been just taken away. All his ability to, and I'm sure that he may have, even in his, his prison cell, uh, per, you know, continued to preach repentance, but <clears throat> being baptized and, and repent, but he's confined now. He doesn't have the wilderness to walk anymore. He doesn't have the Jordan banks to walk anymore and to baptize people. He's refined to his prison cell. So what it becomes, and it's going to become the same thing for us, it's going to become a trial of faith. A trial of faith. But the trial of your faith is precious, 1 Peter 1, 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, 
though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Don't lose heart. Don't lose faith, regardless of what happens to us. What if we were to remain on the mountaintop and never see the valley? And that's basically where John is right now. He's always been on the mountaintop. The strong, vibrant mountain man is now confined. We say, would we, we say we would be great. That it would be wonderful to be on the mountaintop. But would it? Look at 2 Corinthians, if you would, and, and, and see the lesson that Paul is teaching here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. You all know this story. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should exalt, should, that I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul's saying, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, we won't get into what you think or what you believe that the thorn in the flesh is, but the idea is that he had it. Why did he have it? Paul was an intelligent man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a well-educated person. And he could have lifted himself up above anybody else at that time. And to keep him on the straight and narrow, Christ allowed him to be buffeted by a messenger of Satan. Thorn in the flesh, if you will. To keep him humble, to keep him in a perspective, because living on the mountaintop isn't always the greatest thing. We learn in the valleys. If we're on top of the mountaintop all the time, we, we start to delinquish our duties. We stop praying, we stop reading, we stop preaching, we stop doing a lot, we stop going to church. Why? Because things are going well. Things are just fine and dandy. But when we're in the valley, it causes us to do one thing, and that's to look up. You have to look up. That's why I get aggravated at those who try to portray Noah's Ark when there was only one window. They got a whole slew of windows on around the outside. It was one window, and it was a purpose for that one window that when things were tough and they were in there for 40 days and 40 nights, that the only place they had was to look up. That's the only place there was any light, to look up. Straight to God and only Him for help. It is not unusual for great spiritual leaders to have their days of doubt or uncertainty. Moses was ready to quit on one occasion. And so were Elijah and Jeremiah. And even Paul knew the meaning of despair. And, and you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength and so much that we despaired even of life. Yep, Paul was anticipating and thinking about suicide. Seeing about taking his life, he's like, I can't do this no more. I just can't handle it anymore. But then he says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, he was ready to go. 
that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. So we can't trust ourselves. We can't think like that. We have to trust God. And now, we have this mountain man looking at four dark walls, contemplating his fate. But he wants to know. <laughs> he wants to know about Jesus. Was I wrong in everything that I've been preaching, everything that I've been teaching, everything that I told my disciples? Am I wrong in this? The second point. We have the question. Now we have the answer. Christ's reply shows no displeasure at the question of John. Isn't that a marvelous thing? He didn't, he didn't go back to his disciples and say, you mean John's in the prison? He's, he's having a hard time believing that I am he who was supposed to come? See, he didn't scold them at all. He wasn't upset. He didn't get mad at the, the question that was asked. Our Lord is very gracious and knows the frailty of our frame. And in verse 21 to 23, he says, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. I think that shows humility. Because Jesus could very well said to his disciples, you go back and tell John that I am the one who's supposed to be here. <laughs> See, he didn't handle it that way. He said, just go tell John what you've seen. Go tell John what you've heard. Those who would speak for Jesus and comfort the tempted must speak what they have seen and heard. Christ never sends anyone to tell what they think we speak that we do know John chapter 3 and verse 11 we do know and in first John chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3 it says that which was was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then... And what a story they had to tell. What a story they had to tell. In verse 22 there, it says, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 22, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor, of the, go to the, poor the gospel is preached. John, have you ever seen anything such like this before? That's basically what he's telling the disciples. Go back and tell him. Did you ever see anything like this before? Have you ever heard of anything like this anymore? And you have to understand that there's like, what, six months between uh, uh, John and, and Christ? They're the same age. Grew up in the same time. So it's very fitting that go tell John what you've seen. Go tell John what you've heard. He's never heard anything like this before. He's never seen anything like this. So, John, what do you think? I think John's sitting in his cell saying, yeah, he's he. <laughs> he's the one. Such a gospel is enough to drive away all doubts and fears, isn't it? That's why we need to do the same. I know people don't want to hear it, but that's why we're here. To tell them about Jesus Christ. Look what he's done. Look what he, you know, look what we've heard. And that's what John saying in 1 John. We have touched him. We have handled him. We have seen all these things. And now we're relating it to you because we want you to see the same things. These people out here, they don't see this. 
And they just think we're a bunch of Bible-thumping people that don't have the first clue what's going on. Then thirdly and lastly, we see the testimony. We see the testimony. As soon as the messengers are gone, Jesus bears witness to the true character and divine mission of John. He asked them, what did you come to see? Did you come to see this little wimpy person out here? What did you come to see? Did you expect this messenger of God to be dressed in fine clothes and, and be like in king's houses? What did you expect to see? And I tell you that no greater prophet born of woman is greater than John. See, their expectations once again was for something that was fancy and elaborate, and Christ count, counted them with it. He, he, he countered with that and says, what did you come to see? What did you expect? Can you imagine John's situation? He, I mean, after all, he's eaten wild honey and locusts. He's dressed in camel skin. I mean, he had to look a sight, right? What did you come to see? What a testimony. He was no silly reed shaken with every wind of doctrine that may blow. Look at the religion out here today. It's shaken. <clears throat> My sister has, is, 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 is in Florida. She has a, there's a big Baptist church she goes to. And some of, and it's not because of me or Brother Chuck, but they heard these messages and they couldn't believe it. It says, why don't our preachers preach like that? Why don't they tell us these things? Because they're shaken with every way of God. They're afraid of making waves. They're afraid that if they speak up and tell you what we're telling you this morning, that they'll walk away. And see, that don't bother Brother Chuck and myself. I, I, I don't worry about those things. All I'm worried about is presenting the truth, telling you just exactly what the Bible says, not holding back, not trying to water it down, but give it to you straight. John was no city slicker in soft raiment seeking to make a display of of himself he was more than a prophet in that he prepared the way of the Lord Christ see here's the thing there's a lesson here if John would have come the way people thought he would have come and dressed real nice and real respectable and you know clean and, you know, and, and clean shaven and, and eating proper food and so on and so forth, what would they expect of Christ? They would expect the Christ to be the very same, wouldn't they? They actually did not believe that Christ was the Messiah because of the way he came on the scene. They wanted a conqueror. They wanted this king born into, the, into their, their country that was going to rule the Romans in the world. Somebody to stand up and fight. He wasn't expecting what they got. And I think that's why God brought John in the way he did. If John's faith had not been tested, we would not have had this beautiful testimony to this, his noble nature. Romans 8, 28. All things work for good. All things work for good. To reject the testimony of Christ's servants is to reject the testimony of God. Look at verse 29 and 30 again. And all the people that heard him and had the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But 
Understand this, this is the world we live in. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Why? Because they did not believe. Of disbelief, that's what these folks out here is their problem, disbelief. And until they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they're going to die in their sins and spend the rest of eternity in a lake of fire. I know people don't want to hear that, but that's what the Bible says. I can't change that fact. That's what's going to happen. That's why it's imperative that we tell as many people as we can about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why this mission's here. That's what our purpose is, to tell people about Jesus Christ. I don't care about the rest of it. I just want you to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want you to see him as I see him. I want you to hear him as I hear him. And I hope we can accomplish that while we're here forever, how long a time we are here. May God bless his word to your heart today.